deserves the praise and all the honor and the splendor and majesty. Powerful, powerful sermon for the glory of God, Pastor Christopher. Next, we have our next sola, sola fide. Pastor Mark Brashear is a pastor of Cornerstone Baptist Church in Chulioto, right here, Chulioto, uh, a northeast suburb of Orlando, Florida. Usually when we explain that, we have to say it's outside Oviedo or outside Orlando. Um, he has been married to his wife, Karen, since 1994, and has two daughters, Abby and Lauren. Cornerstone holds the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith and the mission of making disciples for the glory of God. Has as its mission, making disciples for the glory of God. That mission is sustained and supported by the Spirit of God through the faithful exposition of God's Word and the faithful obedience of God's people. We are committed to edifying the body through the teaching of God's Word, equipping the body through the application of God's Word, and employing the body by sending them out with God's Word in evangelism. Open-air preaching, missions, and more for the purpose of engaging the body and extolling our God, our great God, and Savior Jesus Christ, making disciples for the glory of God. So it is my pleasure to welcome Pastor Mark Brashear. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Welcome. We are delighted to be able to host you all and glad that you're here. And let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, God, we praise your name. God, thank you for the worship. Thank you for Christ. God, thank you for grace. God, thank you for faith. And thank you for your word. Some brother was preaching just uh, those parenthetical moments, God, where we're wrapped up in your glory and we worship you now in this uh, be with us as we study your word together lord for your great name's sake and for your everlasting praise and worship in jesus name amen if you will please turn with me in your bible to revelation chapter 4 revelation chapter 4 our topic of discussion this morning is sola fide, justification by faith alone. I want to begin with entering into a glimpse of this doctrine from Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. And let's begin reading together in verse 1. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Here the Bible says, After these things I looked, and behold, and you can just imagine John's astonishment with what he's seeing, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I'll show you the things which must take place after this. And we know from chapter 1 that that trumpeting voice was the voice of Jesus Christ himself, the risen and ascended Lord. And he's saying with authority here, that sound of a trumpet, with authority, commanding, Come up here, and I'll show you the things which must take place after this. And immediately, John said, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven. And this issue of the throne becomes a theme of John here in chapter 4 and in chapter 5, mentioned 11 times in this chapter alone. This is not a throne of rest at this point in time. This is now a throne of reigning, ruling, and soon to be a point of judgment, a throne pointing to the judgment that is coming. And one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne. We get a picture of this throne in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. The Bible says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire, and fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. And the books were opened. Isaiah caught a glimpse of this throne in this throne room in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And with this throne, we see here the glory of God and the glory of God. He who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone, a sardius, that blood red ruby. 
in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald, meaning that the chief color was green, but like a rainbow around the throne. Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel saw this in chapter 1, verse 27, when he says, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around, like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. And so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And so when I fought, saw it, and this is the, re- the appropriate response, right, to the glory of God, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one speaking. Here a rainbow around the throne, and the appearance like an emerald. In verse 4, Revelation chapter 4, around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, just symbolizing the perfect righteousness of Christ, credited to the account of those who would repent and believe the gospel. And they had crowns of gold on their heads, and from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. It reminds us of Exodus 19, doesn't it? When the people of Israel came before Mount Sinai, and they heard the thundering voice of God, and they heard the peelings of thunder, lightning, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. And the first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. It's permanent, consistent, constant worship in heaven of God, Lord Almighty. Isaiah 6, 3, the prophet Isaiah said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And this holiness and this trifold proclamation of God's holiness is God's complete and total separation from sin. God alone is majestic in holiness. Holy and awesome is His name. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, The prophet says, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. We're reminded in the words of Christ in Matthew 5, you are to be perfect just as our Father in heaven is perfect. And we hear the words of God himself saying, you shall be holy for I am holy. We see the lightning and we hear the thunder. We feel the heat and we know that our God is is a consuming fire. Here in heaven, sinless angels charged with the constant and eternal worship and praise of God. They do not rest day or night for worshiping the living God. We see in the testimony of chapter 4, verse 11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And the 24 elders cast their crowns before him and are bowed down and worshiping God. He is worthy of our worship. Amen? In chapter 5, verse 11, angels numbering 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands praise and worship Christ with a loud voice saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Do you see how glorious this glimpse, this view of heaven, how perfect, how fervent, and pure the worship and praise of God, and how worthy is God to receive it. Do you see in this, this is what you're created for. You're created for the everlasting praise and worship of Almighty God. Do you feel in this the weight of your sin? How imperfect, how impure And in our own righteousness, we are hopelessly consigned to stand afar off from this glimpse of the glories of heaven and cry out with Isaiah, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. 
Then I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Understand that the context of this praise of God's holiness here is the judgment of the unrighteous. Because He, God, is perfectly holy, God hates sin. And in perfect justice and in perfect righteousness, He rightly pours out His perfect wrath upon it. And you are a sinner, and I am a sinner. What is there that you can do that is not corrupted by the flesh? What is there that isn't polluted by pride or stained by selfish motive? John Bunyan said that even his best prayer contained enough sin to damn the world. In your own righteousness, even the apparent good that you attempt to do is as nothing but a filthy rag. And you would cry out with those sinners in Revelation chapter 6 to the mountains and to the rocks. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? The prophet Nahum in chapter 1 verse 6 says, Who can stand before his indignation? And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire. And the rocks are thrown down by him. Psalm 130, verse 3. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? And the right answer to that rhetorical question is no one. No one who isn't perfect, righteous, and holy. Martin Luther, just prior to his conversion, and just prior to the spark that ignited the Protestant Reformation, he was about to address God in his first Mass And he froze with this glimpse of heaven. At these words, he said, I was utterly stupefied and terror-stricken. I thought to myself, with what tongue shall I dress such majesty, seeing that all men ought to tremble in the presence of an earthly prince? Who am I that I should lift up mine eyes or raise my hands to the divine majesty? The angels surround him. At his nod, the earth trembles. And shall I, a miserable little pygmy, say, I want this, I ask for that? For I am dust and ashes and full of sin, and I am speaking to the living, eternal, and true God. In all of created humanity, there is no one who can stand before this throne in the light of this holiness under the holy, just, and good law of God, and be declared righteous and worthy of anything other than God's eternal judgment. Will you stand before God, who defines holiness and profess to be holy, profess to be good? It then begs the question, how can a sinful man be right with God? How can I be justified or made right before him? How can I be righteous? What must I do to be saved? The Philippian jailer to Paul and Silas said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The crowd at Pentecost, men and brethren, what shall we do? Paul on the road to Damascus, crushed under the weight of his sin, what shall I do, Lord? And this question, of the most important of questions, is answered by the glorious doctrine of the justification by faith alone. Justification by faith alone, as one theologian put it, is the atlas that bears the weight of the entire world on its shoulders, the entire weight of Christianity. Martin Luther has said that the church stands or falls on this one doctrine. It is the essence of historic Christianity and the essence of the gospel And that which makes Christianity distinct from every other religion. Christianity is the religion of divine accomplishment. It is finished. It is done. Based in Christ's finished work alone and in nothing else. All other religions are ultimately based on human effort. The sinner's own efforts to be holy. This is the doctrine of the justification of faith by faith alone. I want to give you three exhortations 
with respect to this doctrine, justification by faith alone, sola fide. One, you need to prove it. You need to be able to do that for yourself. You need to protect it, and we need to preach it. We need to prove it, protect it, and preach it. First, if we want to be able to prove it, let's look at Paul's argument for this. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. There's a great argument in Romans chapter 3 for the justification, for justification by faith alone. And that begins in verse 19. And we'll walk quickly. There are glorious truths in this chapter, and we could spend months in these verses alone. But in chapter 3, we see Paul's argument for justification by faith alone. And we want to be able to prove this doctrine from this passage. So let's walk through it together. We begin in verse 19. This is Romans chapter 3, verse 19. And here the Bible says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Here in verses 19 and 20, the verdict is in. He begins with, we know. That's the word oida. It's a perfect, complete understanding. It is unquestioned. It is uncontested. It's not developing. It is known. This is not the word ginosko. This is the word oida. It is known here, complete unquestioned. Every person outside of Christ, outside of grace, is under the law of God and accountable to God. In chapter 2, Paul explains that the Jews were under the written law of God, and Gentiles there show the work of the law written on their hearts. As Paul says again in Romans 14, so then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. In the imagery here of the courtroom, we are all declared guilty. Guilty. There is no hope of acquittal. There is no defense. There is no excuse. The only response here is silence, that every mouth may be stopped. There's no possibility of parole. There's no possibility or hope of purgatory. Here, the only thing that settles is the certain fearful expectation of judgment. What can be said in your defense? Imagine that throne room in heaven. What would you do? You'd pollute it. You'd corrupt it. There's nothing that can be said in self-defense. Silence your self-justification so that you can hear the truth of the gospel. Silence is the only appropriate response. You can't say anything. And if you can't say anything, what is there that you could possibly do? What could you add? What would gain merit with God? What would gain his favor? What can you do? You are unrighteous. That verdict is in. There's nothing. There are no works that will justify you in his sight. There's no sentence to expect here but the death penalty. And rightly so, the death sentence is deserved. And when we look at works and those things that we think make us a good person or the things that we do that we think are good or righteous in God's eyes... We have to be reminded that the law of God was never intended to be a means of salvation. We cannot be saved by the law, Old Testament or New Testament. The law was intended to show the impossibility for someone to be righteous in their own effort. To meet to or attain to or rise to a benchmark that God himself in his holiness has set. You can't do that through the works of the law. The works of the law, the law is intended to show us our sin. In other words, nothing a person does, nothing a person does, no matter who they are doing it for, no matter the, how appropriately placed or not their motivations are, nothing they can do can gain favor with God. If you're trying to be a good person, if you're working to be a good Catholic, you're trying to straighten up your life so that you can become a Christian, Christian, if you're looking at your Christian performance as the ground of whether or not you're on good good terms with God, you cannot. Paul would say of you in Romans chapter 10 verse 3 that you are ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish your own righteousness. You're not submitting to God's righteousness. God's righteousness is the only righteousness that will stand. It's God's righteousness alone that is perfect. God's righteousness alone that satisfies the just demands of God's law. 
In chapter 3 here in Romans, in verse 21, the Bible says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and by the prophets. And now Paul, having used the law justly to bring about guilt, Paul now here reveals hope. The only kind of righteousness that man can produce is unrighteousness. The righteousness of God here is that righteousness which is authored by God. It meets every demand of God's justice. This righteousness is character, characterized in its essence by all that God is and all that God does. And this righteousness Paul is proclaiming is in perfect harmony with and attested to by the Old Testament Scriptures, being witnessed, it says here, by the law and the prophets. Look what it says in verse 22 now. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. This righteousness, authored by God himself, comes to every believer, Jew or Gentile, through the vehicle or the means of faith in Jesus Christ. This is, this righteousness is sinless perfection, which only Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone has fulfilled. He endured our every temptation and yet was without sin. This comes to every believer. It's not righteousness through the law for the Jew and through faith for the Gentile, but both through the means of faith alone. Sola fide. It goes on in verse 22, For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here all men, whether Jew or Gentile, are under the very same verdict. All must have the very same remedy for their sin problem. And that remedy is in God's glorious wisdom. Don't you praise the Lord that this doesn't come from within us? But it comes by God's grace, as our brother preached, from without us. And God grants and gives it. This righteousness is the righteousness of God that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. Now think about it here. For there is no difference. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. With the lost... There is no distinction between those who are lost. All have sinned, and all must have the righteousness of Christ in order to be saved. In that essence, in that sense, the chief of sinners today is saved. The chief of sinners was justified. He wasn't too depraved to be justified by God. Whatever sin that you're in, the Lord God in His grace and in His mercy can save you from that. Be sure that he won't save you in it. Turn from your sin. But whatever it is, God will save if you will put your faith in Christ. Stop relying on your own effort. Stop relying on your own goodness. Silence your self-justification and hear the gospel of God and be saved. Verse 24, what a glorious explanation here of the gospel. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We could easily spend weeks on, on this one verse. Being justified. Justification here is the opposite of condemnation. Condemnation doesn't make a man guilty. Condemnation declares him guilty. In the same way, justification is a declaration. It's a completely forensic or legal transaction that changes the judicial standing of the sinner before God. It is a statement, it's a declaration that all the demands of God's righteous law are fulfilled on behalf of the sinner. In justification, God imputes or credits to the perfect righteousness of Christ to the believer's account and then declares that person right before him. This is not the infusing of a righteousness to us, but the imputing of a righteousness. Not the infusing of a righteousness into us, but an imputing or accrediting of a righteousness to us. And because Christ is the federal head and representative of his people, God can impute his perfect righteousness to us because Christ himself has secured that righteousness by his perfect life or his perfect obedience to the law 
and because he bore the penalty of the broken law on our behalf. If you will repent and believe in the gospel, all of this, as our brother preached, is by his grace. Notice that this is a free gift of his grace. Therefore, it's not a result of anything else. Throughout this passage of Scripture, it screams grace alone. It screams faith alone. There's simply nothing else that you can add to the perfect wisdom of God in redeeming a sinful humanity. A gift, by definition, is something given freely. It's unmerited. And here, it's another way of expressing that this is not anything to do with works. It's apart from any work, anything that you can add. All this only through the price paid by Jesus Christ, the ransom price paid for our rescue. And here we begin to see something interesting uh, as well. The act of justification is now seen as a matter of grace on God's side and a matter of faith on ours. Grace and faith fit perfectly together, and we'll see that. The ground of all of this is the perfect life of Christ and His perfect substitutionary death. You must have a substitute. Will you stand in that throne room with your sin? Will you stand before God, the holy of holies, before thousands and thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand, and have your sin laid bare before Him? You need the righteousness of another. The price paid for our redemption was the atoning sacrifice, the substitution of Jesus Christ at the cross. He paid for it with his blood. He shed his blood. His death was not simply a witness. It wasn't simply an example. It was a sacrifice. It was an actual substitution. Verse 25 goes on. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith, to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In verse 25, the satisfaction here of God's wrath, wrath inherent in justification is also through the vehicle of faith. It's also through faith alone. Then says that God, in his forbearance, passed over the sins that were previously committed. What that doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that God swept sin under the rug. It doesn't mean that he excused it or winked at it. Uh, this, in reference, if you think about it, to Old, Old Testament saints, for example. Take Abraham. God exercised patience, exercised forbearance in passing over those sins in light of of the certainty of Christ's coming sacrifice. God never tolerates or excuses sin, sin in any form. Then in verse 26, it says here that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. God is serious, deathly serious about sin. You don't want to receive justice from God. You want to receive mercy from God. Justice gives you what you deserve. Mercy is a grace. The perfect justice of God is proven, upheld, it is vindicated, it is displayed in the death of His own Son, in the death of Christ, the horrors and the glories of the cross. The sacrifice of His own Son is how, is how God maintains His perfectly righteous character at the same time that he justifies ungodly people. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15 says this, He who justifies the wicked is an abomination to God. And in that sense, he that justifies the wicked is unjust. That God is perfect justice. God certainly isn't unjust. Here, God maintains his justice because Christ himself bears his justice on behalf of the ungodly. It begs the question then to prove the point here of justification by faith alone in verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. 
Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. And that there, apart from the deeds of the law, with, every, with everything that's been said to this point, is faith alone. Faith alone. Because of the power of the cross of Christ. Because of the sacrifice that was me- made. Because of the infinite value of that sacrifice. Because of the completeness of that work which Christ had on the cross, it is finished. And because of the perfect righteousness of Christ, there is nothing further for a wicked sinner to add here. To do so would render the cross of Christ and that sacrifice of no effect. What could it be but faith alone? What could it be but grace alone? What could it be but Christ alone? To the glory of God alone, according to the Scriptures alone. It can't be anything else. What would you add? You're standing in the throne room in Revelation 4. What would you add to the glories of heaven? What can you add besides the righteousness that is not your own? Therefore, a man is justified by faith, and that justification by faith alone. Many false religions will say that they uphold grace. Many false religions will say that they uphold faith. But it is, as our brother said, this word alone that differentiates wicked works systems from the only true salvation As wonderful as other Christian graces are, it must be only by faith. The Bible doesn't say that you're justified by repentance. But be sure that if you do not repent, you will perish, right? It's not justification by humility. Although humility is a great Christian grace. It's not justification by meekness. It's not justification by hope. It's not justification by love, which the Scripture says is greater than faith. He that does not love does not know God, but it's not justification by love. It's not justification by prayer. You can't say a prayer. You can't make a decision. It's not justification by sacraments. If righteousness came by any of these sources, it would be the antithesis of grace. It would be the antithesis of faith. It is by grace alone, and because it is only by grace, it must be by faith and by faith alone. Whatever you add to either one only ends up subtracting. You add anything to grace, you negate it, right? You add anything to faith, you negate it. You negate both. Romans chapter 4, verse 4 says this, Now to him who works... The wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, that not of yourselves, anything that you could add, anything that you could imagine. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, which is another way of saying not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast. Oh God, that we might be found in Christ, having not our own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Why here? Why isn't it repentance? Why isn't it humility? Why isn't it love? Why isn't it hope? Why isn't it prayer? Why isn't it those sacraments? Because faith simply receives and rests upon Christ and upon His righteousness. The very substance of faith is that it rests, that it trusts, that it relies upon the righteousness of another. Faith is the receptive, empty hand of the depraved, destitute beggar. And in that sense, it is completely compatible with grace rather than anything that we would do. Anything that we would do is incompatible with grace. There aren't any works that we could add. Nothing in my hands I bring simply to thy cross. I cling foul, foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Faith is of a trusting, 
of everything we are to everything that He is. Do you want that within yourself? How? How can you trust within yourself? How can you look inward and say that I have some merit that will gain my favor with God? How can you save your own soul? It's a reliance upon Christ in all things. It's a reliance. I heard this illustration, and I like this. Imagine a king, a wealthy king, wealthy beyond imagination. And this king, traveling throughout his countryside, uh, he sees in one of the poor, destitute villages a young girl. And in his travels and in his work, he looks at this young lady with favor and sets his affections on her. He chooses to love her, chooses to set his affections on her, chooses to identify himself with her. And so he identifies himself with her by leaving the palace, by leaving the kingly garb, by leaving the pomp and the circumstance, by leaving the praise of loyal subjects, by stepping out of the palace and stepping into the squalor of this poor little village, stepping into the filth and grime, stepping into the toil and labor of hard work, stepping into that environment in order to unify himself or unite himself to her, to identify with her. And he lives in that condition. He lives in that state, the palace afar off. And then one day, he proposes. And in a moment, he says to her, if you will unite yourself to me, then you can have everything that I have. Everything that I own is yours. I give it to you freely if you will unite yourself to me, if you will commit yourself to me, if you'll leave this squalor and live in the palace with me. And at the moment that she trusts the offer and commits herself to the king, her station dramatically and radically changes, does it not? Everything now, based on the word of the king, everything now is credited to her. Everything now she possesses. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. The Lord of glory wrapped himself in the likeness of sinful flesh. Toil, weariness, labor, tears, sweating great drops of blood. The horror of Golgotha, the torture of the cross. And he says to you beggar, to me beggar, all that I have secured is yours. You'll be a son in the kingdom adopted into my family, an heir of eternal life by uniting yourself to me by faith alone, according to grace alone, to the glory of God, the saving God alone. We unite ourselves to him by faith. Now, this is, to the Christian, isn't it? A cherished doctrine. If you can't get yourself riled up over salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, then you've got a terrible problem. So doesn't it behoove us then in great heritage of our Christian brothers and sisters throughout the centuries to protect this doctrine? Once you prove it, the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit, proves this doctrine. It is so crystal clear in Scripture, it is unavoidable. But we must protect it. Where there is... The central aspect of our justification with God, we will witness the greatest assault of the forces of Satan arrayed against it. The doctrine of faith alone is as much under attack today as it ever has been. And this demands 
that we would contend earnestly for the content of the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And I want to give this to you, this exhortation to protect this uh, in three primary ways. Three primary ways that this doctrine is subverted. One, this doctrine is subverted or reduced, reduced by practice. In other words, in the life, you say that it is not enough. It's reduced to something that is insufficient, reduced to something that is lacking, reduced to something that needs your addition to it, which is ridiculous. It is reduced by saying that it is not enough and that you must add works to it. Those who trust Jesus Christ for justification, for that declared right standing with God, by faith alone, they receive a perfect righteousness. In the same way that God is perfect and cannot be added to or changed, that righteousness received by the believer when they repent and believe in the gospel is a perfect righteousness. It cannot be added to. It is faith alone, grace alone. Those who attempt to mix anything with it render the cross of no effect and fall short of its perfection. It is perfect. This is the essence of Israel's apostasy. This is the essence of Rome's apostasy. It is rooted in their abandonment of justification by faith. And as Paul said, seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is perfect. So we must protect it against adding works to it. Christian, protect justification by faith alone in your sanctification in that you don't add your works for any merit before God. Your works are a fruit of this faith. Secondly, to protect it, those that would assault justification by faith alone reduce faith to a declarative act of justification alone. They reduce faith to a declarative act of justification alone. And there is so much more. This is a rich doctrine laden with grace from God. If you reduce it to a declarative act alone, in other words, I say a prayer, I make a decision, the Lord gives me righteousness, then there's no repentance. Where is repentance in that? Where is the holy life that should flow from justification by faith alone? There's no fruits. It eliminates the transformed heart and nature involved with regeneration. It creates the damning heresy of the carnal Christian. There are no fruits that flow. It eliminates the inevitable fruits that flow from a believer's new heart in Christ. It reduces sanctification to nothing more than a believer's own efforts. And we're to live by faith in Christ. As such, it separates justification from that which it should be married to, which is sanctification. They're distinguishable but connected. In effect, it turns the grace of God into licentiousness. That grace of God turned into licentiousness is the hallmark of easy believism, antinomianism. The characteristic that identifies biblical faith is the fruit of biblical obedience to Christ. You're to live for the Lord. He who says he knows him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. Because the Lord with his own blood purchased your obedience in the very faith that he provides for you, and he purchased that on the cross with his own blood. He purchased your sanctification. He purchased your glorification. He purchased your obedience. All acquired through faith alone. Here the voice of James cries out, faith without works is dead. It is dead. And here with the voice of James, it's not at this point, how can I be saved? But it's how can I know that my faith is authentic? You must follow that up with holy living. The Puritan, Thomas Manton, wrote this. By the righteousness of faith, we are acquitted from sin. But by the righteousness of works, we are acquitted from hypocrisy. You can't be a hypocrite. But lastly... They reduce faith by reducing God to a God of their own making. And as such, 
They are idolaters. If we lose an understanding of who God is, we lose a right understanding of justification. If you lose, Christian, listen, if you lose that glimpse of heaven, if you lose that sight of God's searing holiness, if you lose an understanding of His justice, if you can't see the glories of Christ, if you can't understand the sacrifice that it took to redeem you, and in that sense, if you can't see the cross, then you lose sight of justification. And the world has done this. This is a device of Satan. I'm not that bad, and God's not that mad. There's no preaching against sin, hard preaching against that which would condemn you. There's no preaching of the justice of God, the holiness of God. Now, God is your homeboy. God is your genie. No, God is holy, holy, holy. And God, in His holiness, has perfect demands. How can you fully understand the desperate state of your condition if you don't know who God is, if you don't know what God expects, if you have no understanding of how perfect and holy He is? How can you see your dire need of a righteousness that comes from outside of you? And that's, again, only by the grace of God when He opens your eyes and makes you alive in Christ. You must be crushed under the weight of your sin. You must come to Christ on His terms, by faith alone. Faith, the empty hands of spiritual bankruptcy. Will you lay your life down? Will you lay your life down? But lastly, you have to prove it, you have to protect it. But brothers and sisters, I mean, we need to preach it. Our world, this world, has inoculated itself against the various frameworks of this very doctrine. And this is by the design of the ruler of this world. The only hope that this world has, Christian, is this the same hope that you had when you were lost, is that the word of God would be preached to you. That someone would come and preach to you justification by faith alone that your wretched soul would be saved. And you're here as a trophy of God's grace because someone was faithful to preach that doctrine to you. It must be preached. Is the world coming to church? No, they are fleeing. They are fleeing and they're fleeing in droves. The church must go to the world. And you've got to preach this doctrine. How will they be saved? How? They must hear the preaching of this. How will they hear without a preacher? And they've got to hear that preaching, sin, judgment. They've got to hear the bad news so that they can, with heart given them by God, take the good news. You can't give them what they want to hear. You need to give them what they must and need to hear. And how will they hear without a preacher? We've got to preach this. If you're here today and you've not come to the end of yourself, you've not bowed before God in desperate need of a righteousness that you don't have, if you're crushed under the weight of your impurity by that glimpse of the throne room of heaven and the worship of Almighty God, and you've never turned from living life for yourself and placed your faith in Christ alone and turned from your sin, why? Why not? In one heartbeat, one heartbeat, you could be standing before Him. The God, the creator of the entire universe, your creator, He owns you. Will you stand before Him in your own righteousness? Now you'll stand and you'll say, I am undone. Woe is me. You need the righteousness of Christ. How will you get it? You're going to continue trying to clean your life up? You're going to continue to think that, man, I just got to do this, that, or the other thing. Yeah, I need to read my Bible more. What is keeping you from serving the Lord of glory 
Trust in Christ. Rely on Christ. Nothing in your hands you bring, simply to his cross you cling. And foul, foul you. Fly, flee to Christ. Let him wash you lest you die. You've got to leave your squalor. You've got to get out of that pig pen of the far country. And you've got to cling to Christ. Commit yourself fully to him. And in the glorious wisdom of God, in the glories of his perfect redemption, the perfect price and the costly price that was paid, you too can be a son or a daughter of the kingdom. Standing before God, clothed in a righteousness that is not your own, clothed in a perfect righteousness that you can add nothing to in all that by the, the gift of God who has chosen to set his affections on you. Praise and worship be to God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, God, thank you for this glorious grace. God, thank you that while we were ungodly, that you died for us or that you pulled us, God, drug us out of the sewer of our own sin, that you drew us to yourself, you opened our eyes and turned our hearts, gave us a new nature in Christ, that you granted us repentance and faith. God, and saved our souls. Thank you, Lord. And we will, God, as trophies of your grace, proclaim those excellencies so that your name may be made famous among the Gentiles. And God, we will, with those that are already worshiping in heaven, we'll worship you, Lord. We'll worship you for all eternity. For the glory of your name, God, for your everlasting praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Um, so just a few housekeeping um, points. We're about to have lunch.